About five years ago, when I was 16, I was living in western Pennsylvania in a heavily forested area. On this particular night, I was home alone with my younger brother, while my mom was out at a baby shower. I was in the kitchen making dinner for myself when I heard a knocking on the front porch. This wasn't a common knock, like someone might be waiting for me to open the door. It was more like a few loud taps close to one of the front windows. I paused and glanced around. From where I stood in the kitchen, I could see the front door and one of the front windows. All the lights on the ground floor were on, and with it being dark outside, all I could see in the windows was a reflection of the inside of my living room. I waited for a few moments, but when the sound didn't come again, I shrugged it off and continued concentrating on the stove. After maybe five minutes, long enough for me to forget about the sound, it repeated itself. This time from the front window at the far side of the house. Mark? I called out, thinking it might have been my brother. There was no response. I walked over to the front of the house and peered outside with my hands pressed to the side of my face, but I couldn't see anything. I turned as my brother came down the stairs. Did you just hear something from around back? He said. I held up a finger to indicate that we should pause and listen, and almost on cue, we heard footsteps calmly walking across the wooden floor of our wraparound porch, just outside the dining room wall. There's someone out there, I said quietly, more angry than scared. It was at this point that we should have locked all the doors and called out the window that we were calling the cops, but I was a stupid headstrong kid and pissed off that someone was messing with us. I remember my brother asking if the person outside was trying to distract us, but I was already at the gun cabinet. I should point out that I was raised with guns, and I knew how to properly handle one. I pulled out the 9mm from the drawer and loaded it. I'm going to scare him off, I told my brother. Lock the front door behind me. Before I could even give him a chance to argue, I was marching to the door with a gun in my hands. I threw open the door and stepped out onto the porch. My brother then flicked on the outside lights, and right there, about eight feet in front of me, was a sickly thin guy wearing a hoodie with light blue eyes and a soul patch on his chin. He had been in the process of stepping onto the porch, but the moment he saw me he spun around and ran like a bat out of hell. I took off running a few yards after him, then stopped, pointed my gun in the air, and fired off a shot. That's right, fuck off! I cried out. I waited until he disappeared into the trees before turning around to face the house. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that for a few moments my heart stopped. I felt that momentary wave of ice water through my veins, and the painful thudding of my heart in my chest as it tried to correct its rhythm. There was at least eight other people standing around my porch, and a handful more scattered around the yard. They were mostly men, but there was also at least two women, all dressed in dark jackets and hoodies, looking mostly like they were in their early 20s. None of them said anything. Instead, they all just stared at me, their hands mostly in their pockets, and I couldn't tell if any of them had weapons. Then they all just scattered. Some jogged away, but most of them just walked off in different directions out into the woods. I legitimately forgot for a handful of seconds that I was holding a gun, until I raised my hands to my face and felt its weight. I sprinted back to the front door and pounded on it until my brother let me back in. I had no idea what to tell him. I had just fired a gun up into the air and none of them had cried out or made any sound whatsoever. Had they had been drunk or something and were trying to pull a prank, they would have said something. They would have been like, Whoa, sorry man, wrong house, put down the gun. But all they did was just look at me like I had just ruined their surprise attack, and more disappointed than scared, they all just wandered off. I had no idea what to make of it. My brother turned on all the lights in the house, and called the cops, who to their credit arrived within 10 minutes, and swept the perimeter. There were footprints everywhere, and they asked my brother and I numerous times if we had just had a party. I kept telling them a dozen or more people had just been loitering around our house in the darkness, but the cops didn't seem to take it that seriously. They asked if the strangers had threatened us, and I had to admit that they didn't in any direct way. They confiscated the handgun after I told them that I fired off a round, but they eventually returned it. I have no idea to this day what those people were doing that night outside of our house. My brother suspects that they were part of some kind of cult, 
and maybe have been setting up to perform some kind of ritual, and maybe that we were set to be human sacrifices. I thought it more likely they intended to break in and rob us, but saw the gun and bailed. That doesn't explain the silence, though. None of them uttered so much as a sound as they looked at me and just, as if instructed by some signal, scattered all at once. I've read that during alleged UFO sightings, people can become hypnotized by lights that appear above them, and they wake up hours later in entirely new locations having no idea what happened or how they got there. I can't dismiss that kind of possibility. They all seem to be hypnotized. That group of people has never returned, and I haven't even caught a glimpse of anyone I recognized from that night in town. We bought a dog not long after. Back when I was in high school, my brother and two cousins ventured out on a long hike through miles of empty forest wilderness behind our house. We had explored the woods plenty of times as kids, but this time we wanted to go deeper than we had ever gone before, with food, flashlights, and knapsacks and everything. Fully aware that we would probably be gone for several hours, and possibly might have to end up stopping and camping for a night. I did my best to mark a route for us using a map and compass. It was stupid. Four kids under the age of 17, thinking that we could safely travel that deep into the sticks without anything happening, but we were young and confident, and none of our parents tried to talk us out of it. I was the oldest and the largest. I carried the compass and most of the supplies, including the tents and water. My brother Joe carried the first aid kit and flashlights, while my cousins Lily and Tom split the food between them, and Lily carried the flare gun. We only had one shot to use and assumed that would be enough. We walked the majority of the day without incident, and after a few hours we spotted in the distance a wooden structure sticking up out of a tree line. Uncertain of what it was, we made for it, deciding that that was where we should set up camp. The sun was just starting to set by the time we reached it, and it turned out to be a very old overlooked tower, probably for spotting forest fires. We estimated that it was probably 60 or 70 feet high, but it would be perilous to climb. The staircase was a single winding path that wound up the perimeter of the tower, without any support beams. We dropped our bags at the base of the stairs, and debated on how high we should climb. Lily and I wanted to make for the top, but Joe and Tom didn't trust the stairs, worried that they could give way beneath us. Lily and I made our way up slowly, placing one careful foot in front of the other. When I was about halfway up, a rotted plank broke from beneath me, and my whole leg sank down through the wet wood. I came down at an odd angle and bent my right leg. I cried out and pulled my left leg through the hole as I sank down to sit carefully on the stairs. Tom and Joe heard my cry and started up the stairs, and Lily in turn started back down, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but we were all panicking kids. When the others got to me, I immediately started insisting that I was okay and that we all couldn't be up here this high on this weak staircase, and we should start heading back down. Joe was the first to reach the bottom when he stopped, pointed towards a nearby tree, and yelled, Hey you! We all looked. There was someone standing by a tree just looking at us. We couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, but the figure was extremely lanky with a ridiculous amount of gray hair and wearing an ancient jacket and jumpsuit. It looked like they had been just peeled off from the bottom of a dumpster. The four of us froze, and we all just stared. None of us knew what to say as the figure just stared at us. Then the stranger came towards the stairs. We freaked out and all scampered as fast as we could, right back up the stairs towards the platform. I stopped about two-thirds of the way up and looked back. The person was going through our bags at the base of the stairs. I then yelled, Get the fuck out of there! while the others tried to open the trap door at the top of the stairs. The figure looked up at me and called out something that I couldn't understand. I'm not sure if it was because the others were making so much noise right above me or because the stranger wasn't speaking English. It was a very high-pitched voice, so I assumed at that point it was a woman. I pulled out a small pocket knife and sat there, waiting for her to follow us up. She didn't. She sat at the base of the stairs, ate our food, and pocketed most of our things. When it became full dark out, she was still sitting there, and we were all unsure of what to do. We couldn't get up onto the platform, and we couldn't see enough to know if it was safe enough to climb down. I know what you might be thinking. 
You chicken shits, just go down and grab her. And that very thought crossed my mind several times during the night, but without flashlights, and given the fact that I was injured, I didn't want to risk it. She could have had a weapon on her for all I knew. She most definitely had access to the flare gun, not that it would have helped us much if we had it. With the platform above us, we couldn't fire it straight up to signal for help. By the time first light of dawn peeked through the trees, I was stiff, very hungry, and sore. Joe, Tom, and Lily spent a sleepless night trying to remain quiet and not shift their weight very often. The figure down below was gone. We limped to the bottom of the stairs. We grabbed what possessions we had left, and Tom and Joe helped me hobble back home on one leg. It was the longest 14 hours of my life, from when I hurt my leg on the stairs to the moment I sank down in agony on my couch at home and took off my boots. To this day, I still have no idea who that woman was, most likely some homeless weirdo hiding out in the forest where no one could bother her. We also didn't know why the trap door wouldn't open. Tom presented the idea that someone may have locked it from atop the platform. Not sure how that would work. As miserable as this experience was, we all made it back shaken and exhausted, and other than my hurt ankle, we were all unscathed. It didn't occur to me until much later that hurting my leg may have saved us all. What if we had camped on the ground that night, and while we were all asleep, the strange woman had crept into our camp. I think it could have been a whole lot worse. This is one of those experiences that sticks with you regardless of how much time passes. The kind that you make sure you tell your friends and family when reminiscing about scary experiences. This took place during my high school days back in 2008. Starting high school wasn't exactly the best time in my life. I despised the politics of the high school microcosm, and I didn't get along with most of the students or the teachers. I was kind of an outcast. I decided that I was through with school because I saw it as nothing but a toxic environment and a waste of my time. This naturally didn't go over well with my parents. My mother is a school teacher, so I would have to hear those lectures about how education is the foundation for the rest of your life, blah blah blah. Looking back from where I am now, I can agree, but I was an impulsive teenager with a lack of common sense. After about a year, I enrolled in an alternate school called Moore Mickens, which was a place of sanctuary for pregnant teenagers and dropout rejects like myself. They offered me the opportunity to obtain a high school diploma and a special program that would allow me to graduate a year earlier than what I was supposed to. I was originally class of 2011, but with this program I was now officially class of 2010. Shave a year off my sentence? Sign me up. I went through the process of being enrolled, and before I knew it I was hopping on the bus for my first day of my sophomore junior year. I couldn't help but bask in the admiration of flunking my freshman year and yet was still one step ahead of my former classmates. When I arrived, it was basically back to square one for me. I was surrounded by young women in various stages of pregnancy, and young men with time in juvenile hall under their belts. Needless to say, I didn't exactly fit in with the crowd, so I sat alone in the cafeteria during breakfast and stared off into space, speaking to no one. Until this dude I recognized walked through the lunchroom doors, his name was George, and he was one of the very few people I actually talked to at my previous high school. We weren't exactly close friends or anything, but he was the only person I knew at Moore Mickens. It turns out we were pretty much in the same boat. I waved him over and we made small talk and reconnected. Later that day, my sister offered to pick me up from school, so after classes were over, I went outside to the parking lot to wait for her. George had someone picking him up as well, so we got to talking again. How was your day, man? It sucked. I hear you, man. People are so fucking stupid. I wish I could just kill them all. Um, yeah, sure. I'm serious. I would totally bring a gun to mow them all down. I fucking hate people. Yeah, um, sure. Hey, there's my sister. I'll catch you later. George went silent and gave me a blank stare as I quickly made my way to the car. Now you're probably wondering why that conversation didn't raise any red flags, but I had about a million things on my mind. So I brushed off the morbid conversation as just bitter adolescent talk. The next day the class schedule alternated, and George and I ended up having the same art class. 
On a side note, the art teacher and I were cool because she would let me draw pictures of skulls and zombies and stuff instead of doing the lame-ass work she assigned. Anyway, I was sitting at a table with George and two other guys. The two dudes were talking to each other, and I was drawing this sweet picture of Iron Maiden's The Trooper. George suddenly got up and walked over to the classroom door and ripped down a map of the school that was taped to the wall next to the door. He brought it back to the table and proceeded to mark on it with a red pen. One of the other guys asked him what he was doing. You'll see. Everyone will. Even then, I didn't think too much of it, even though I remembered the conversation we had at the parking lot. You have to understand that George seemed to get off on the uncomfortable attention he got being vague and creepy, and this school was meant to be a place for outcasts. I figured he was just imagining some fucked up fantasy or something. A couple of days after that, I was walking to art class again, but just before I entered, the door opened and a police officer left the room escorting George away, followed by the principal. I froze in genuine shock and dread, and all I could think was, oh shit. George was staring right at me with cold eyes as he passed, and I had to look away. Turns out, I wasn't the only person he hinted to about his twisted aspirations. The school was full of young parents after all, and apparently they took his behavior as more of a threat than I did. And in retrospect, I don't blame them. They found some stuff on his MySpace page that alluded to some sort of plot to shoot up the school. Here in Florida, threats like that are taken very seriously. Even if it is just some fucked up teenager spouting some bullshit because he hates his life. It turns out the police found more than 28 firearms at his home. Although to be fair, they were all registered to George's grandfather and were kept in a locked gun cabinet though I suppose getting access to the guns wouldn't have been too difficult for someone like him. Thankfully, George was taken away, and nothing ever came of his plans. Sadly, more Mickens was shut down a few years ago. Aside from this incident, I ended up having some pretty good times there. I got my act together, and ended up graduating in the class of 2010. I can't say for sure if George would have gone through with it, but I'll never forget the cold certainty behind what he said that day in art class. You'll see... Everyone will. Number 1 My brother had a creepy experience with a house during his time in Japan. He sent me an email of the story. Instead of rewording everything he says and giving it to you in a third person perspective, plus I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste it and let you read it. Hey, I don't mind you posting about the house. Just don't put my name or anything like that. Don't put yours either. And don't go to any chat rooms or Skype ever. Chat roulette doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm only kidding. You're still just a kid to me. Anyways, here it goes. I'll try to remember the best I can. I guess it all began when my friend Jesse started dating this Japanese girl named Chi. We were talking about watching a movie about a haunted house and Chi didn't want to watch it. She said she knew of a real haunted house. She told us about the house on the cliffside in a dead forest. I know what you're thinking, not the suicide forest. She just meant all the animals there were dead or something like that. So we basically convinced her to take us there. Just me and Jesse at this point. She takes us on a drive that ends in the middle of nowhere and next to a trail in the woods. There was a little chain tied to two trees that wasn't doing much to keep people out since it was dropped to about ankle height. All we had to do was step over it to enter the trail. Chi told us that she was staying in the car and nothing we did could convince her otherwise. So me and Jesse head down the trail and walk for about 10 minutes until we got to the point in the forest where everything got silent. It's not like it was loud before. I didn't even notice the noises like the sound of crickets, birds, buzzing of insects, and things like that. When it becomes completely silent, it just hits you. There are no animals in that part of the woods. Me and Jesse just took one look at each other, and we both read each other's minds. We turned around and ran. We ran without stopping the whole way back. I didn't hear anything, but it just felt like something was chasing us. I beat Jesse to the end, and was almost in the car when I heard a thump and yell. I turned and saw Jesse on the ground. 
The chain rope that was ankle height had somehow caught him in the stomach. It left a mark and everything. I had to help him up and we got out of there. But fuck that. We were getting to the bottom of this shit. So we got four more guys together, brought flashlights and guns and went back. It was scarier in the dark, but with the other guys, we felt safe. We made it all the way to the end of the path this time. We knew that we were coming up on something near the water, because we could hear waves crashing against the cliff. Sure enough, when we got to the clearing, we were on the edge of a cliff. We were all facing a little house that looked like no one lived in it for at least 10 years. We went inside, and found that it looked like the family that lived there just disappeared. All of their belongings were tossed everywhere, but that could have been from people ransacking the place. I'm not sure. But it looked like clothes, dishes, and furniture were still there, just left behind and forgotten. The most alarming thing though, and the first thing you noticed was the walls. The fucking walls. Every inch of the walls and every room was covered in ash. Not just like painted in ashes either. It was covered in words written in ash and in some weird language. Latin if I had to guess. It looked like someone dipped their finger in ash, then started at where the wall met the ceiling and began writing something. Then when they got to the end of that wall, they made a new line right underneath. It continued until the wall met the floor, and they went to the top of the next wall. I can't imagine how much time that took. The creepiest thing is that Jesse told me that he asked Chi in private what she had heard about that house, and Chi told him that the legend says a mom who lived there went crazy one day and killed her husband and four children. She turned herself in and said she killed them and burned their bones. The bodies were never found, and the lady spent the rest of her life locked up in some asylum. It makes me wonder, though, about all that ash. How much ash would it take to cover your walls if you burned five bodies? Would that be enough? I don't know. Crazy shit. Anyways, I won't be able to sleep after thinking about it. Next time you send me an email, ask me about sunshine and rainbows. Number 2 When I was 12, my parents and I moved to another state. The house they chose was built in the 1960s by an architect who designed it himself. It was in the shape of a T, with the stem of the T being the large master bedroom. My bedroom being in the furthest left of the T, with also two living rooms separated by a kitchen also in the top of the T. The way to the front door of the house was to actually walk past a beautiful stained glass window that took up the entire east wall of my parents' bedroom and into the crook of the T on the right side. Needless to say, it was a weird house. It also had a basement. The basement had a deep freezer room, an office, and an incredibly creepy crawl space that opened up into a giant cavern of dirt piles as far as you could see with a flashlight. That pretty much made up the underbelly of the whole house. In the backyard was a giant slab of concrete that looked like it had been haphazardly added, apparently to fill in a pool. Now I was 12, but I wasn't an idiot. This house was not child friendly, and it was incredibly weird. It didn't help that my bedroom was so far away, and this house was so old and bizarre that if I yelled in my bedroom, you couldn't hear it from the other side of the house. Skip to night one in the new place. I hate it. I curled up in my little twin bed, trying to get used to the weird sounds and sights that the house has, and not really understanding why I was banished to this corner of the house where it was the coldest. The screen to one of my windows rushes in the wind from outside, and I take off running to my parents' bedroom. I slept in their bed that night. After a few nights of this, my parents finally decide I have to sleep in my own bed. No questions. I am given a little stuffed dog to keep me company who I named Sherlock. I was kind of worried about him discovering bones in the basement. Of course, I ended up taking off running back to my parents' bedroom and slept cuddled between two annoyed parents. Finally, my mom decides enough is enough. I can sleep in the room closest to the bedroom on a large chair. Now, this chair is right next to the basement door and also to the back door. I agree to sleep in the big chair because I have never been allowed to before. And also, 
It's as close as I can get to my parents' bedroom without getting them upset. I throw a million blankets in a pile and nest onto the chair for the night. Surprisingly, Sherlock and I do seem to fall asleep quickly. At some point in the night, I wake up to what sounds like footsteps on the basement stairs. And the basement door is open. I scream so loud that my dad comes running out. He slams the basement door so that he has a clear view of me trying to become part of the furniture. Why did you open this for? Are you trying to scare yourself? Dad, I didn't open the door. It was already open. At this point, my mom comes out to comfort me, but she doesn't seem at all calm. Her hands shake as she helps me get untangled from the blankets. She takes me to their bedroom and we fall asleep, albeit after a few bedtime stories. I wake back up to the sounds of more feet, this time on the carpet. I lie completely still and hope the noises stop. But then, I heard whispering. I nudge my mom, and she just rolls back to her position. I then poke my dad's arm. Nothing. Mom! I whisper right into her ear. I then heard somebody whispering back at me from the dark. No. I scream loudly and clutch Sherlock to me, but neither of my parents moves. Something tries to grab my foot over top the blanket. I scream louder until my throat hurts. Both parents are still and breathing quietly. I stop screaming and listen, trying not to pant. I shake my mom. She is completely passed out. <laughs> Giggling comes from the door by the bathroom and I hear it creak open. The green clock numbers on the dresser glow against the door so I can see it begin to move. As I remember it, the numbers actually start counting backwards, flipping slower and then faster and faster until it was almost blinking. Two sunken eyes seem to glare at me from the corner and I leap over my dad to the other side of the bed. The bedroom door is dead bolted. My parents did this to make me feel safer, but now there's no way out. I hear the door bump against the dresser and I panic. I grab something heavy, it was a box or a book, off my dad's nightstand, and I throw it at the stained glass window, and it bounces off. Something grabs my foot and pulls me under the bed, where I fight and scrape and hit at the soft leathery thing that is trying to hold me down. I feel sharp pains, and I hear snuffling like a runny nose, and there was a flurry of limbs almost like a giant spider. I finally connect with something hard enough to get out from under the bed. I threw the object again at the window, finally shattering it, and I ran out through the front gate into the street. I run for a long time, making sure whatever it was wasn't behind me anymore. I then don't really remember what happened after that. My parents told me they later found me curled up on a bench at the elementary school about a half mile down the road. I had stained glass in my hair, a black eye, and my left arm was broken. I had numerous cuts and bruises around my ankles and neck. We moved out of that house as fast as possible, sleeping in a hotel until it was all packed up. The police believe I may have fought off an intruder who broke the stained glass wall to attack my parents. They had no other explanations to give me. The person I see for counseling says that as a child, I had to find something tangible to rebel against, since I was not happy about the move. The beautiful stained glass wall was the focal point of the house and was the easiest to fixate on, especially since my mother loved it and it was something really easy to destroy. The wounds I suffered were likely self-inflicted as I ran possibly in a sleepwalking state, through the streets until I ended up at the school. However, when I asked my mom about that night, she said she was shaken too, because the basement door had a key lock on it, and only my dad had the keys. They were in his nightstand that night, and she had made sure to lock it because she was afraid I might go explore in the basement and fall down the stairs. She really has no idea how it opened. To this day, I still have night terrors of that thing with its dark pits for eyes, grabbing at my ankles and pulling me under the king-sized bed. I still don't know how my parents didn't wake up through all of the screaming. 
My therapist says I must have dreamt it, but I didn't dream of the glass breaking. Surely they would have heard that, 